by the value of v, then you break the tag on the value of v using the value of c. So that's you know that's you know how we build this index. It's a confident index over uh, the third key a and b and c. Okay. So that means that uh, we're gonna make the following observation, which is given a conjunctive normal form such as this, a equal to five and b equal to three. We claim this index match this conjunctive normal form, or in other, in, the other way is fine as well, which is this conjunctive normal form match <coughs> this particular index. Uh, what I mean is you can potentially use this index to speed up the processing of this particular query. So why is that? Why this index can be used to uh, uh, answer this query is this term here, this conjunction of form here, is a prefix. It's a prefix. It's a prefix of your search key. When that happens, you can use this index to uh, answer this query. The reason is the data entries are sorted with regard to any prefix of a search key. So this is really the key of this. Right? <laughs> Data entries in an index are sorted with that to Obviously, it's sorted with respect to the search key itself. That's true, right? That's for sure. But a byproduct of that is data entries are sorted with respect to any prefix of your search key. In other words, if you are sorted with respect to A, B, and C, then you must be sorted with respect to A, with respect to A and B, and finally with respect to A and B and C. Does that make sense? Henceforth, if a conjunctive normal form matches any prefix of your index, then you can use, obviously use the index to facilitate the answering of that, that query with that particular conjunctive normal form. Because data entries are sorted with respect to uh, uh, those terms. Then you can use the index to answer uh, that query. Okay, so that's the operation. But this is only true if you match the prefix of your uh, search key. When this is not the case, then this index cannot be used to answer this query. For example, if my search condition becomes b equal to 3, you can no longer use this index on a and b and c. Does that make sense? Why is that? Can someone tell me why is that? Why this index on a and b and c cannot be used to answer uh, a search with query condition b equal to 3. Okay. Uh, so I don't know, well like in an extreme case, maybe all of the records, like a, looking at a and b is distinct, so you don't even look at c, so then c is just, it doesn't give you any selectivity whatsoever. And a and b first, and then that. Yeah, so summarize, if you only have this condition, and your index is it is, it, it is not a prefix of your search key, right? So what that tells you is those data entries are not sorted with respect to the value of B. <coughs> so the value of B really scatter around. If you look at the leaf level of this index. So it's a random ordering of, of B values in, in, that, in, that, in that sense, right? If it's a random, random ordering of B values <coughs> in the leaf level of your tray, Obviously, this is not going to help you in any way uh, in terms of answering this particular word. But this is not true if your search condition is a equal to 5 and b equal to 3, because that's a prefix of a and b and c. So you did entries, you know, given this observation, <coughs> your data entries must be sorted with respect to a and b. So I can use this index uh, to answer that query very quickly, but not the second query where b equal to 3. What about hash index? So that's for the tree index. Now we know how we 
can quickly determine if an index can potentially help you answer a particular query or not. By the way, the importance here, the important note here is this prefix matching trick only tells you if an index can potentially help you answer a query or not. It doesn't really help you to tell how expensive or how efficient it is to use that index to answer a query. That's a separate question to ask. I'm just asking whether this can help you to answer this query or not. In other words, I'm asking, is having a car useful for me to go from here to Boston? The answer is yes. Is having a bike useful for me to go from here to Boston? The answer is yes. Okay. But is having a heavy backpack useful for me to go here, from here to Boston? The answer is yes. Does that make sense? But it doesn't tell me how efficient or how expensive it is for me to go from here to Boston using a car, using a bike, using a heavy backpack, and so on and so forth. It only tells me whether it's useful or not to make a decision. But it doesn't tell me how efficient or how expensive it is to use the index to answer my query. Which is a separate question and also an important question because that determines whether you want to use the index to answer your query or not. But we're going to answer that second question later. Now let's just focus on whether this is useful or not. Does that make sense? Now, what about hash index? One observation clearly is that hash index is only useful for equality conditions. Only useful for equality conditions. It is not useful to answer a range words. It is not useful to answer range words. And that being said, a simple observation is to, for a hash index to be effective, its search key must contain all the uh, attributes in your conjunctive normal form. Let me repeat that, right? The search key of your hash index must contain all attributes from your conjunctive normal form. For example, if your conjunctive normal form is a equal to 5 and b equal to 3, only a search index with both A and B are useful towards answer this query. If you have a search, if you have a hash index with only a search key equal to A, it's not going to be useful to answer this query. Why is that? Because if I have a hash index such as H of A to different brackets, right? In order to answer the square a equals 5 and b equals 3, what I have to do? What I have to do? I have to really draw that second term in my conjunctive normal form and focus on only the first term. Then I can use this index to answer the square. Suppose that leads me to this bracket, and this bracket has, let's say we're using a linear. <coughs> linear hashing. So we potentially can have overflow brackets right? since we're talking about linear hashing. This b equals 3, so all the entries here, they guarantee to have their a value equal to 5. But it says nothing about their b values. So in order to complete the search of this query, you really have to go through all these overflow buckets in order to make sure you find all the data trace with value b equal to 3, which can be expensive, right, if, if there is a lot of matching uh, data trace with value b equal to 3. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that means that, uh, as you can tell, you can still use a hash index even if, you know, the search key does not contain all the attributes from your conducting all form. You can still potentially use it it's just that the cost of it might be uh, really high. The cost of it might be really high. And, and then uh, to generalize that argument, what if my search condition is this? If my search condition is this, can I still use this hash index? Someone tell me yes or no. <coughs> Can you still use this hash index to answer this word? 
Well, if you don't care about the cost, the answer is still yes. Right? Let, let's assume that A is a positive integer that's less than, less than 10. Assuming you have this knowledge, can you use this hashing dash after this word? You say yes. Yep. Which is? Yeah. You convert this query to a, a set of queries. You convert this single query to a set of queries, and you can still answer this by using this hash hash. Does that make sense? And potentially, this is still much more efficient. So essentially, you are doing four probes <coughs> into your hash index versus if you if you ignore the hash index, you have to do a default scan. So four probes into your hash index probably is still going to be much more efficient than an uh, entire default scan. But that only works if your domain size is small. What if I change this to this? A is a positive integer, but less than solvent. Then this trick no longer works. You only have to do thousands of probes into the hash index. Uh, by the end of that, maybe you are better off just do a linear scan on the entire file. Does that make sense? So now we understand you know, how we uh, decide if an index is useful towards answering your query or not, right? To summarize, the, the, the trick is to convert your uh, query condition to conducting normal form. There are multiple terms. And you look at if those terms match a prefix of your search key, if it's a tree index. Or if the terms contain uh, the set of attributes from those terms match uh, the search key of your hash index. So those are the two methods you use to determine if the index is useful or not. Uh, once, you, once you make that decision, once you know if the index is useful or not, the next decision to make is how efficient or how expensive it is to use that index to answer my query. Right? For example, is having a car useful to go from Southern City to Boston? The answer obviously is yes. But you don't know until you look at the Google Maps <coughs> to figure out how expensive it is to use a car to drive from here to Boston. Right? So you need to estimate that as well. For example, is having a bike useful? Yes, obviously having a bike is useful, but if you look at Google Map, uh, biking from here to Boston is going to be expensive, right? So, 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 so you still have to make that second decision. Uh, so that, uh, how to make that second decision, uh, that discussion is to come later because that depends on the selectivity of your query. That depends on selectivity, selectivity of your query. It's just like the example I gave you in last lecture where, where we use a sorted file as an example, right? Whether you want to use a binary search approach or just doing a, 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 a key file scan really depends on the selectivity of your query. So the answer to that second question is not so trivial. It depends heavily on the selectivity of query. And in order to do that, we need to first understand how we estimate the selectivity of a query. All of this we will discuss later. Uh, for now, we're going to talk about the general approach to answer the selection queries. Uh, there are really two approach, uh, two approaches. The first approach, we find the most selective access paths. And we should tell us using it and apply any remaining terms that do not match the index. So what do I mean by most selective access paths? The definition is an index of file scans that, that we estimate will require the fewest HIOs. <coughs> so to give you an example of this, to give you an example of this, right? Uh, think about the, uh, uh, the sorted file example I gave you last time in last lecture. When the selectivity is small, the most selective access path is to do binary search to retrieve your uh, tuples. <coughs> but when selectivity is large, meaning you are selecting almost all the records, the most selective access path is no longer 
the binary search followed by uh, 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 sequential scan. It's simply a linear scan the entire file. Okay, so that's you know what we mean by most selective access paths. I'll give you another example. Right? <coughs> if I have a B tree index on A, B, C, and my search condition A equal to five and B equal to three, the most selective access path most likely will be using the B tree, go down the tree, and then do linear scan at the leaf level. <coughs> For this query. But if my query condition changed to this, the most selective path is no longer to use the B path, but just do a key pass scan. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the definition of most selective access path. And terms that match the index reduce the number of top of the tree. So to give you an example, Imagine my index is A, B, and C. My search condition is no longer just A equal to 5, B equal to 3, but the following, which is, let's say, A equal to 5, and B equal to 3, and B equal to 7, for example. <coughs> if my term is this, if my conjunctive normal form is A, B, and D, then these terms, A equal to 5, B equal to 3, matches my index. And this term does not match my index. You follow this discussion? Yes or no? Okay? My, suppose my index is A, B, and C. So there is a prefix of A and B that matches my term. And by the way, the reason we want to use conductive normal form is that when you have a conductive normal form, the ordering of the terms is irrelevant, meaning that I can change this to <coughs> okay, and I can still find a match for my index by using these two terms. So the benefit of converting your expression to conjunctive normal form is that the ordering of the terms is no longer relevant. So that's the benefit of using conductive normal form. So if I even I flip the order of these two terms, I, I still can find a match to the prefix, to the prefix of my tree, of my search key of the tree. Okay. So what, what this statement here is saying is that given a conjunctive normal form, you may find only a subset of terms form a match of your index. But that's okay. You're going to use those subset of terms <coughs> as your most selective access paths to retrieve you know, top of satisfying those conditions. Meaning, I retrieve top of satisfying A to 5 and B to 3. And only after that, so I use this as my access pass to find those records. And afterwards, I apply the remaining terms on all the tuples I have identified afterwards. You follow me? I do a post processing, which is a filtering step afterwards. Okay. So that's the first approach. So let's consider a, a, a couple examples. Suppose this is my conjunctive normal form. And uh, suppose you have a B3 index uh, with a search key on um, date, on um, this date actually. Then clearly, you know, there is a match between uh, the first term and the third key of your index. Okay? And then you can use BID equal 5 and SID equal 3 to check all the tuples returned from the tree uh, to complete the search for this query. Right? Similarly, 
if you have a hash index BID and SID, you found another access pass. Now you have two access paths. One access pass is to do the search using the VPass tree on the value date. And then apply BID and SID afterwards as a filtering step. The other access pass is what? Is to do the search using BID and SID over the hash index. And for all the record returned from the hash index, you check the condition on the date attribute afterwards. So you have two different access paths by now. Do you follow me? Yes or no? And you have to decide which is more efficient. In other words, which is the most selective access path. That obviously depends on the selectivity of these terms. The selectivity of each term. For example, if all my reservations are made before this particular date, if you know that for a fact, you will not go with the B3 access path, right? Because that filter away no records for you. You end up checking BID equal 5, SID equal 3 against all records in your database. Do you follow me? And you want to, if you know that for a fact, obviously the hash index will be the most the selective access path. But if I, if I change my condition that, oh, there's only a few reservations made before this particular day. Then using the B-tree may be uh, the most selective access path. It will be more efficient than doing the hash approach. So the question heavily depends on, as you can tell, the condition of your query as well as the distribution of your data. So it's not a trivial question to answer, right? So you may wonder, how, how do I figure out if I know, you know, there are all the reservations were made before this particular date, or only a few reservations uh, were made before this particular date. This, again, boils down to the question that we said earlier that we're going to answer later, which is the selectivity estimation. Okay. For now, let's assume there's a black box for you to tell you what's the selectivity for a single given term or a combination of terms. And then using that knowledge, you can quickly estimate what's the cost of different access paths. You follow me? Okay. <coughs> there are some challenges here. For example, if you have a deep path tree on R name and date, that doesn't constitute a valid access path because it doesn't, it does not match you you search condition does not match any prefix of your tree. However, this works, right? This works. Because the you, you term form a prefix of this tree index. If you have hash index on the and R name, it's not useful towards answering your query, unless you know for a fact that the R name has a very small range. In that case, you can use this trick. Essentially, the trick is to Suppose you R name has a very small range, and your date has a small, very small range. You can find all the combination between uh, all the possible dates and other R name values, then probe into your uh, hash index. Right. But that only works if you have small domain combos. Okay. So that's the first approach. So the first approach, the idea is you find, you know, to quickly summarize, right? You find all possible access paths. For well, tree index is you find the prefix of your search key among your terms. For hash index, you find all matching terms of your hash index search key. These are possible access paths for your CNF, for your conducting normal form. Then for each access path, you evaluate the selectivity of your query, of the term matching that access path. Then you estimate the cost of using that access path. Then at the end of the day, you select the most selective access path to answer your query. All the remaining terms that were not used in that access path will be used in a, a post-filtering step. So that's the first approach. 
Okay? What is the second approach? The second approach document is, okay, you may have multiple access paths. That's okay. Instead of choosing just one access path, why not use all the possible access paths? Okay? And then do an intersection at the end of the day. Do an intersection at the end of the day. I'll give you a concrete example of this. <coughs> Suppose my search condition is this. Again, I have a B tree on date, I have a hash index on BID and SID. So obviously you have two access paths in this case. The access path on B tree with respect to the date attributes and the access path using hash index on BID and SID. The earlier approach says you choose whichever the most selective and go down that path and do a post filtering step. The second approach is to say, okay, use both access paths. <coughs> use the first access path to find all the records satisfying the condition on the first term, which is date less than a particular value. And use the second access path to find all the records satisfying uh, the equality condition on BID and SID. And then if you do an intersection of those, you will be able to find out your answers. You will be able to find your answers. So that's kind of the idea here. Right? So the question boils down to how how efficient you can do intersection. So can someone give me an idea of how you do set intersections? So the problem boils down to, I have two sets, A and B, right? Mm -hmm. I want to find the intersection of A and B. Uh, how do I do this efficiently? Can someone give me some idea? Of course, there's a naive algorithm, which is for every element in A, I do a linear scan of all the elements in B and check if A is in B. So the algorithm is. Yes? Do another form. Many, many pages so that 
each element of B goes to different pages. So the search on that given page is very efficient. So end up to be linear cost. That make sense? So basically, imagine your dictionary. Do, do we have a dictionary somewhere? Okay. Imagine your English word dictionary is not that many pages. It's a huge, gigantic page like this. Nobody's going to use that dictionary. That make sense? So next time, don't complain, oh, why my dictionary is so thick, so heavy? It's so purpose. <laughs> that make sense? Imagine I replace a heavy, thick, <coughs> bulky dictionary with a single giant page. You're not going to use that dictionary. <coughs> now, next time you realize when you do that, you're using a bad hash, bad hash function with many, many clear. That's the simple. So. Okay? But the English language, if you think about it, is a bad hash function, right? Why well, I say that? Because the letters start with A, sorry, the, the number of words starting with letter A, number of words starting with letter B, and so on and so forth, is not a balanced distribution. We know that, right? Not a balanced distribution. That's why searching for some particular word will be more expensive than searching some other particular word. It's because you have more clearance over there than, than, than some other words. Okay, so, so there are two approaches he mentioned. One is to build a hash index over A or B, then uh, pro. Most likely you will get linear cost, much, much better than this. Another approach, but, but the downside of that is potentially you may still get n square cost if your hash index is bad. How do you guarantee a better performance than this? Uh, he also mentioned, briefly mentioned, Dina, maybe you want to complete that. Oh, I was going to say you could just obviously use a B plus tree on the. Yeah, you can Sorry, build a B plus tree, but that's kind of like sorting, right? Essentially, yeah. you sort A. Once you sort A, <coughs> for every element B, it takes only logarithm time to find a match. So the total cost reduced to n log n. In fact, you can sort A and sort B and do a merge of the two. Kind of like the idea we have in the merge sort. And we merge them. And then you uh, cross over all the matching pairs. That's the answer of your intersection. Okay. So this guarantee to be n log n, which is way better than uh, n square cost. Which is way better than n square cost. And for internal memory, the cost is n log n. For external memory, it is, is you know, that n over b log n over b and over b. Right? Two of this plus one. For well, external memory, the cost of <coughs> Okay. So for projection, so we're done with the discussion on selection. The only thing left over there is, you know, later on, I promise I will give you a discussion on selective estimation. Once we have that, we complete the discussion on how a database engine actually answer a, a selection work. Right? We know how to deal with selection now. Now for production, production is relatively easy to do. Right? Production is actually very easy to do. The only complication arises when you try to uh, deal uh, with duplicate elimination. We have the keyword distinct. We have the keyword distinct. And by now, you guys should know there are really two ways of eliminating, eliminating duplicates. One is to do a hash index. The other is to uh, sort the input. Either approach is fine, right? In practice, most time people use hashing to remove duplicates because we all, by now, we know how to design a good hash function. So the chances, the chance where you have a really bad distribution after hashing is very low. Uh, so using hashing typically gives you linear cost. Uh, to remove duplicates. So typically people use hashing to remove duplicates. Okay. So there's an example of this, I will skip this. So you guys can read this example, right? So this is a duplicate innovation using hashing and using index. Okay. Using index is kind of using sorting, right? So, so I, I leave those discussions for yourself to, to, to read out the election. Okay. Now, so next we're going to talk about joint operator. Which is a big part of the lab's record. Okay. 
you know, join is obviously an a, a expensive operation, right? So if you use a for loop to carry out a join operator, uh, obviously that's going to be expensive, right? That's, that's square cost. So obviously you want to do that. So how do you uh, uh, deal with the problem of join? So assume that we are we focus on equality join on one join column, meaning that there's, there's one attribute you are joining over. So that's the simplest case you can have for a join operator, right? So in uh, in relation to R squared, this is R join S. The naive solution, if you think about the conceptual way of evaluating join we talked about earlier, which is to produce a cross product of the two, then going over the cross product and eliminate records who do not satisfy the join condition. And that's essentially the, the n squared approach. Because producing the cross product R cross S is n squared. Right? If, if size of
这是 R， 这是 S。So R has multiple pages, and S has multiple pages. What I will do is I will bring the first page of R into the buffer and pin that page. In the buffer, and then I basically bring all these pages to the buffer one by one. So the first page comes here. When the first page is here, I basically check every record from this page. So you have many of this, and you have many of this. I do a pairwise checking of any two pairs. Check against the joint condition. Once I'm done, I throw away this page. I bring the next page in, and so on and so forth. That's how I carry all these algorithms. You follow me? <coughs> yes. So what's the total cost of of this algorithm? Of course, it's slightly different from what we're doing here. Which here I'm. I'm I'm pinning this whole page of data. So for every page, I look at all the other pages. Right? What this algorithm says is for every record. So you don't even pin the page. You pin a single record. Pin a single record in the buffer. Then you look through all the other pages, right? So the cost obviously is this is number of records. This is how many such records you have to pin, and for each such record, you look through all the pages. And by the end of the day, by the end of the day, you also load all these pages once. So you have to count for that cost. So that's the cost of this algorithm. Okay? And a slightly better approach is, of course, page oriented. Uh, that's a new joint, which is instead of pinning just a single page, I'm going to pin the entire page, uh, by doing that, I reduce my cost to this. For every page on R, I loop through all the pages in S. At the end of the day, I also read all the pages in R once. So that's the total cost for the second hour, page R to S, which is obviously better. But then the observation is, Wait a minute. You buffer size is m over b, which is much bigger than two. In this approach, you are you are only using two pages of your memory space. You should be able to do much better than this. Why don't you pin multiple pages in the buffer, just using the same idea, but? In multiple pages, I call a block. So I pin a block each time of pages. <coughs> I pin a block of pages. Then I loop through all the pages from the other side. And once the page is inside, I do checking, cross checking of this. This, where each error means that I check pairwise records from those two pages. <coughs> of course, I have to reserve a page for all. So for all the records that satisfy the joint condition, I will push to the output, output buffer. Whenever this is failed, I dump to the disk. I empty this. <coughs> so that's kind of the algorithm here. Now, what's the cost of this algorithm? What's the cost of this algorithm? Well, it depends on the size of your block. What is the size of your block? Well, the size of the block is simply m over b minus 2. Minus 1 for the upper buffer, minus 1 for the equal buffer. 
So the number of pages here is m over d minus 2. That's the size of your block. Okay? How many such blocks you have from R? How many such blocks you have from R? Well, this many blocks. Take the ceiling of this. That's the number of blocks you have. And for each block, what you are doing? You are reading all the pages from S once. So for each block, you are paying this many IOs. For each block, you are paying this many IOs. And at the end of the day, when you finish this process, you have read all the pages in R once. But you read that block by block. But now, nonetheless, you have read all the pages of R once. So there's a cost of N1 plus B and one and let me over the end. <coughs> you follow me? Of course, you may, you know, by, by looking at this procedure, you may wonder why I have to do this. Why not I change the game? I can also do the following, which is my output buffer is here, and this is my input buffer. And I can have a block of pages from S. I can also do this. Right? And if you do that, the cost will be
Okay? And now suppose this is my S, I have multiple edges of data. And this is my S, I have multiple pages of data. But the, the difference is now I have an index. I may not have any value equal to blue. I 
may not have any value to do, right? Who said I must have value to do? So I start with value to do value. Okay. And then I have a block of value equal to green. Then I may have a block of value equal to, let's say my green is toward the end. Who have a black ground? <coughs> So what this says is value of B equal to black, value of D equal to green, and value of B equal to red, and I have a relationship where red less than black less than green. This ordering is must be reserved across both ends, right? Because you are sorted with A and B are the same attribute. You are sorting with red to the same attribute. So the fact that red less than gray must be true is a universal fact. Right? So that's what you have. You're wondering, okay, what's the big deal? Why you're doing this? Why you're doing the coloring of this? Why are you doing the coloring of this? By the way, coloring is a fascinating problem, right? So there's a famous coloring problem, which is given a map, how many colors you need to distinguish any two neighboring objects. Have you heard of this problem before? Who do you know the answer? What's the necessary number of colors? Seven. Huh? Seven? Five? Seven. Three? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> So first of all, you know the problem, right? It's a very natural problem. Suppose you are a publisher, and you need to publish a map of all the countries on Earth. Obviously, you want to make sure two neighboring countries are marked with different colors. Right? No? You want to mark the US in one color, and Mexico in one, another color, right? If you mark them in the same color, in today's politics in the US, I'm sure you're in big trouble. <laughs> no? Come on, they don't even want to use color, they don't even want to build a wall, right? So, so that a lot of color, right? So you must have different colors. Right? So the question is, if you have all these countries, uh, Europe is a better example, the US is actually an easy case. You only have Canada and so that's why I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this, right? What if U.S. is in Europe? How many walls are you going to build? Like U.S., you don't have Canada and Mexico to worry about, right? And you don't have to worry about Canada. Canada is like, it's always there, right? So you don't have Mexico to worry about. But if you're in Europe, look at Europe. All the small countries, right, surrounded by these many countries, right? How many walls are you going to build? And you have different color walls, right? So how many, the question is, if you are publishing this map, and you want to distinguish different countries, which means that two neighboring countries must have different colors. How many colors do you need? Of course, you can use, if you are 100 countries, you can use 100 colors. Good yes, no brainer, right? But, but of, you don't want to use that many colors. The more color you use, the more expensive it is for you as a publisher to print that map, obviously. The best is you use black and white. You use a black white printer, you can print your map. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. If you go to Europe, use black and white, you cannot distinguish all the countries. So you have to use a color printer, but I want to use a color printer with the fewest number of colors to print my map. The question is how many colors you need. Do, do we know the answers? Three. Who knows the answers? Three? No, three is not enough. Three, three is not enough. Three is not enough. Four for planar graph. No four for planar graph. Yes. Four is the answer. You need four. And there's a f this problem becomes famous. This problem becomes famous for the following reason, right? For the following reason. This problem becomes famous for the following reason, which is this problem is a mathematical problem. 
in the geometry topology problem. But so hard to solve, people don't know the answer. Right? People, the hypothesis is four for many years. People guess the number is four, but nobody can come up with a proof. You know who solved the problem first? Computer scientists. In the, I think in the 80s or 90s, I think it's in the 90s, right? Two guys from, I forgot from where, I think from a European country, because they worry about this the most. <laughs> If I'm in the US, I, I don't care about this problem. Two colors is enough. To the north, to the south. I don't care about the rest. Right? But if you're in the Europe, you worry about this, right? Two colors is not good enough. So they wrote a computer program, and they, they do a simulation of all possible cases, and verify that four is enough. So they do an enumeration, which is the stupidest proof ever. <laughs> but we run this through a computer, right? So it works. So they verify that four is enough. And later on, Mathematician came up with a proof that four is now. Right? So, that's, so there's some history behind this one. This is a very famous one. In our case, the coloring is sort of a different purpose. So once we sort them to do to do the join, the idea is you can skip an entire block. Which is if you have a cursor here, and you have a cursor here. But knowing the fact that blue is less than red, what do you know? You know that there's going to be no matching from S to any record in this block of blue. Because blue is less than red, and S start at the red region, means that there, there will be no blue whatsoever after this region. You don't have to look. You know for sure there's no blue afterwards. So you can skip the entire block. and jump to your red block without doing anything. And now you are in red region here, you are in red region here, what do you do? What you do is, and this is your black in this case, you will bring this region here, bring this region here, so you have two red blocks. Of course, their size might be different. You bring those red blocks into the memory, and you do a in-memory nested loop join. In-memory nested loop join. And which incur no I.O., by the way. The only I.O. you pay is the linear cost, which is to bring the two blocks and you produce the output. And once you're done, what do you do? <coughs> you fast forward the cursor to the next block, not next page, but next color block, which is to here. And on this end, you jump to here. Now what can you do in this case? Well, you can again skip the entire block. Well, you know black must be less than gray, Henceforth, there should be no black here to match any black here. So you have you can skip the entire black block and jump to the green block. And then when this happens, what do you do? Uh, you bring the two green blocks to memory and then you join it. You follow this algorithm? Uh, what's the cause of this algorithm? Well, at the end of the day, if you look at what we, what we are doing, at the end of the day, what really happened? What has really happened? You read all the blocks of R once, you read all the blocks of S once. In other words, linear cost. So this algorithm is linear cost. Of course, you have to do the sorting of R and S. So the sorting cost. But after the sorting cost, this whole algorithm is simply a linear cost. Uh, incur linear number of IOs. Of course, linear is the summation of total number of pages. Tricky issue here is this: this is linear cost, 
assuming that each block actually fit in your memory. In the worst case, what may happen? In the worst case, what may happen is, for example, my entire R is a, a big red block. Like you're using this algorithm to join, right? You, you go Germany, France, Italy, Slovenia, even better. Right? Smaller, smaller blocks. Then you come to US, you come to China. You <coughs> blow up, right? So that's the worst case, right? So what happens is if you have a big block that doesn't fit in the memory, then this is no longer linear cost, obviously. You have to do something. And that's a special case. I'm not going to discuss how, you know, the way to deal with that is, uh, uh, is to uh, further divide up that block. But I'm not gonna, let's assume that we're not dealing with that special case. In most cases, each block, even though your entire table may not fit in the memory, but each block will be able to fit into the memory because you, block, you divide a table into multiple blocks. That's how you do So I guess what I'm trying to understand with this example, what I don't think I get is uh, with each block, like in our case with R and S and then I and J, mm -hmm. so does that mean that um, like each block of red has an equal value for, for I? For I, yes. Okay, then like wouldn't you have to anyway, like it ends up, do you have to cross these big two regions anyways? So yeah, but, but if you don't do the sorting, the picture is as follows. If you don't do the sorting, you, what the picture looks like is, if you don't have the sorting, the picture will be, Partition phase 
is identical to the partition phase we talked about before for group by aggregation and duplicate elimination. Which means you build a, a you use a, a hash function, and you have a one input buffer, and you load every page of R and ask each record in that input buffer go through this hash function H, which is mapped to different uh, output buffers, B minus one, M over B minus one of them. And then whenever output buffer is filled, you dump to the corresponding partition on disk. At the end of the day, table R becomes M over B minus one partitions. Similarly, you carry out the same procedure for table S. So table S becomes <coughs> M over B minus one partitions. What, what is the key observation after this? The key observation is, in some sense, what's going on is this. In some sense, what's going on is, suppose this is your R, this is your S. And after the partition phase, what do you have? After the partition phase, this R will become the following. The first partition, let's say the first partition has grain. Then all the grains must be in this partition, if that's the case. You cannot have grain in any other partitions. But I may also have bread in this partition. Uh, then I have blue partitions. I have black partitions. By the way, when I, when I do have green and red, uh, green and red partitions, you got to have a lot of blue sorting. This is the ideal case. In, in, the, in the standard case, you don't have this. What you have is some green, some red, some green, some red. They're not necessarily sorted. You follow me? Partition 1, partition 2, partition 3. This is for R. Now, for S, what, what, what do you have? What can you claim for S? If the green records of R end up in partition 1, using the same hash function, what can you claim? All the green records of S must also be in partition 1, because you're using the same hash function. So I know for a fact that all the greens of S must be here as well, and all the red of S must be here as well. All the red all the blue must be here, and all the black must be here. I mean, the size of this may vary, right? I have more blue here, I have less blue here, that's just because of the distribution of R and S, but the point is, same color go to the same partition. And you have the same clearing as well. If red and green clear, uh, have a clearing on R, they must have a clearing on S as well, because you are using the same hash function. Now, what do you, how do you do how this helps you to do join? Now, instead of in the original space, if you to carry out a join, you have to, you have to do check like this, like in the max. Everything has to check against everything. After the hashing, what's a, what's a key operation? You only need to check partition with partitions. You never need to do cross partition checking because it guarantees there are no black other than this partition. So you, you do partition-wise checking instead of this messy checking across everywhere. You follow me? So that's essentially the, the, the algorithm, right? You partition them the, in the second phase. But how do you do this checking, by the way? The idea is you buffer this in your memory, and then you use the input buffer and output buffer to linear scan uh, the, parti the same partition from the other side, one by one, and do a in-memory next to join. Once you're done, you throw away this, you go down to the next pair of partition, load one partition into the blocks, and then you just got the other one. And whenever you do this, you only need to cache. There are always two partitions you need to check, right? You only need to make sure the smaller partition fit into your memory. In other words, one partition, 
size of one partition must be less or equal than m over b minus 2. Whenever this condition is true, you can carry out this argument without any trouble. And the total cost is linear. By the end of the day, because at the end of the day, you read through all the partitions, either R or S, once. And in the first phase, in the partition phase, you load every page once, you write every page once. So the total cost is simply And this condition translates to what? If you have a, suppose you have a good hash function to do a, a balanced distribution, what you have is into this value partition, right? The minimum value of this must less equal than m over b minus. Because this, this is the size of one partition from R, size of one partition from S. The minimal value of the two must be able to fit into memory. When this is two, the, the total cost is simply this. And this is the uh, uh, one of the method you have to in lab 3. So with that, I'll stop right here. Uh, see you next week. So for next week, I'm a student. So next week, I have to travel to Dallas for uh, uh, conference, ACMCCS, which is the top conference on security. We have a paper there. I'm still debating whether to cancel the lecture altogether or ask one of my PT students to give lectures. So I will make an announcement for that. Most likely, I will just cancel the lecture, ask you to focus on lab three, so that I don't have to give you an extension on lab three. Okay. So I will make an announcement for that.